Diana is a financial program manager, and she specializes in financial help for myeloma and AML patients. As a professional financial consultant and former caregiver of her husband, who was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, Diana perfectly understands the financial issues facing myeloma patients. John R. Borland, CLUCHFC, has been an active financial planner for over 35 years. Formerly from Vermont, he now lives in Florida. He was diagnosed with multiple myeloma in 2019 and began treatment under the supervision of a myeloma specialist at the Mayo Clinic. He is grateful for having achieved a stringent, complete response without stem cell transplant and remains on a maintenance program. John is trained as a myeloma coach with HealthTree, and he offers his professional expertise and personal experience to support other myeloma patients nationwide. Diana and John both serve as coaches, as mentioned, and they are willing to help you through our free myeloma coach program, which we will talk about towards the end of the presentation. So now, as you know, the topic is preparing for survivorship financially. And as I mentioned today, we're going to have a discussion about how to prepare financially to live long term with cancer while assessing survivor needs. Diana is going to be giving um, a brief introduction of herself. John will introduce himself briefly, and they'll both kind of talk about what survivorship means to them and then start that educational conversation while they'll ask each other questions like, how did you budget long term in your myeloma journey and how did you and your partner's availability to work affect your finances long term, as well as other important questions. So with that being said, Diana, I'll turn the time over to you and then you and John can start your conversation. I think you're muted, Diana. So if you want to unmute yourself, <laughs> no problem. And John, you too. Thanks for introducing Audrey and thanks for everyone who decided to join us. This is very important. Um, John and I are both financial advisors and John has been in it a, a few years longer than I have. I've, I've only been in it a little by 22 years. He's been at 35, quite a few years longer. So um, we are acutely aware of, of health finances need to be driven when you have an acute or chronic illness. And I'm going to come at this from a caregiver um, perspective. I was younger, 10 years younger than my husband, and that can make a significant financial impact on your financial lives. And I also had children that were younger in private school and we still had was preparing for college for them. So I'm gonna come at it from that perspective and John's gonna come at it from a patient perspective. So um, I want to go over a couple of definitions of survivorship. When I was at Salt Lake City, I went to the round table recently and survivorship, that became a title of, of discussion. What does that mean? And that has changed quite a bit, especially in the myeloma community because people are living longer. Uh, and again, it is becoming more of a chronic disease versus a terminal one. So the historical definition is, would include just family members, family members who survived the loss of a, lo of a loved one to cancer. Again, that is just after someone passes. But again, we're looking at people who are living longer longer lives, much longer lives. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention defines it, defines it as anyone who has been diagnosed with cancer from the time of diagnosis through the balance of his or her, li her life, which is a little bit more current and more accurate as to what we are gonna be talking about today. So I would like to start from a patient perspective um, because a majority of people here are patients or they're taking care of patients and, and we're gonna get into my side a little bit later. But John, if you could, um, Give me an idea of what survivorship means to you from a patient perspective. Thank you, Diana. And uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I once heard a story a friend of mine told me, and he said, this is what it's like to get cancer and be told you have cancer. He said, you know, imagine you're sitting at home watching TV and everything's fine and you feel a little hungry. So you go to the refrigerator for a snack and you open the door and there's a mountain lion in your refrigerator. <laughs> That's somewhat a universal reaction that I get as I know in my life and as I talk to other patients around the country. Uh, most of us, many of us may not have had much, many symptoms. We may not, we may have had symptoms that were confused by other diagnoses. And then we finally get the diagnosis and we find out we have something called multiple myeloma, which we may or may not have heard about. So what does that mean? Well, instantly 
I know for myself, um, I kind of went numb uh, with shock. And I'm not someone who reacts very emotionally about many things. So my tendency is to hold it in. But of course, my wife and I immediately went to the, we, we, we learned in a, with a phone call on a Friday afternoon. And the doctor said, call me next week and we'll get you in here for treatment. And we immediately went to the internet and what we saw financially was terrible. We heard about people spending $100,000 and $150,000. And my wife, um, who loves to ride and loves, loves her horse and we're down here in Florida because of it, um, I found out later that she decided to sell her horse without even talking to me because she thought that instantly we wouldn't be able to afford um, the lifestyle that we'd been accustomed to. So in a, immediately we began to sort out the truth and the facts from the fiction and, and eventually the dust settled. And when I finally got to my, my uh, specialist, he said to me, well, he said, look, we're gonna start you on a protocol of treatment. And I would tell you that I'm pretty sure I can get you three to five years. Three to five years, what, what do you mean? Like three to five years? He said, well, until you might pass away. And I go, well, okay. Well, that of course sent a whole nother whirlwind of fear and thought and my wife and I really began to evaluate, and that's really my key point. It, it forces us to come to a point where we have to evaluate our lives, establish our priorities, and then I think financially try to figure out, are we living the lifestyle? Are we living the life that we are gonna need to live to facilitate treatments, going to specialists two, two hours away? What if, what if, what if, I don't get better. What does that mean? Are all our insurances in place? Are all our benefits? Does my wife know where everything is? Have we communicated with our kids? Um, so it forces a reevaluation. And of course, it's evolving because, as you know, um, myeloma is an individual disease. So what happens for me may not happen for the next person. So but I, we really put everything on the table and we began to sort out what our benefits were gonna cover, what our out-of-pocket costs were gonna be, what we needed to cut back on, what we needed, how we needed to change things. And it forced us into that financial evaluation. Now, so fortunately, I, I began walking down the road of treatment and I was headed towards a stem cell transplant. All my doctors told me, my local doctor, my specialist said, this is where you're headed. And if things keep going right, we'll expect the transplant maybe this coming July or August. So I went through essentially five cycles of treatment. In the, in the process, by the way, I should step back a little bit. The minute I found out, I called a friend of mine who was in the health insurance business. And I said, look, listen to what just happened. And he told me exactly what I needed to do with my health insurance. So I had been on a healthcare Medicare Advantage plan. Um, I was intending to stay working initially, at least semi-retired and partially working. And now all of that was changing. And I got off of Medicare Advantage, got onto Medicare with a supplement. And of course, for some of you, this is an enrollment, open enrollment period. So if that's something you're considering, I would encourage you to, to stop and really put some energy into reevaluating your baseline coverage and understanding what's going to be paid for and how it's going to be paid for. Don't be afraid to ask, call your providers, call us if we can be helpful as my Loma financial coaches. Um, and we began to understand what the true out-of-pocket costs were gonna be. And fortunately, my wife didn't have to sell her horse that she thought she was gonna to have to. We weren't gonna to have to move. Um, I wasn't needing to 
think about stopping work altogether maybe, I, but I wasn't sure. But in my case, um, I got to that point where I was getting ready for stem cell and I had the three day assessment in July after five cycles of RVD treatment. And my specialist said to me, John, he said, we cannot find any myeloma cells in your body. Well, okay, well, I, I've gone from being healthy to being scared out of my mind, to reevaluating everything. And now you tell me I don't have cancer? Well, the fact is, as we know, that as my specialist said, you're so fortunate, but um, it will probably come back. But we don't know if it's next week and we don't know if it's 20 years from now. So what does one do? Um, I talked to my doctors, I talked to my specialist, and I personally decided not to go forward with a stem cell transplant at that time, which was supported by my doctors. And I went on to a maintenance program of um, Revlimid and Belcade and now in Laro. And I'm still on that, that, that uh, maintenance program and everything looks really good. But it did force me to think again, well, what are my priorities? When you're looking at death in the eye, everything changes. And I really came clear that my priorities were not working if I could avoid it. Um, and to try to live my life with maximum attention with my family, my best friends, and looking at my bucket list and seeing if I could check off any of those things. Um, so again, it was another reevaluation. And eventually I, I started volunteering. I actually made a little chart and I said, what am I concerned about? Well, I'm concerned about my health. I'm concerned about um, living a life of fulfillment. I am concerned about being with my family and being with my friends. And so I began plotting out what I needed to do to, do, to, to achieve all those things in those four quadrants. And I began uh, volunteering with my Loma crowd. I, um, and eventually I became a my Loma financial coach and I still felt great. I felt a little guilty that I did feel so good because I was talking with many people around the country that weren't doing so well. But, um, and eventually I decided, you know, I think one of the things that I'm not fulfilling is I really feel a need to have a purpose and, um, and feel relevant. Um, so I decided to go back to work in my own style. I wasn't gonna go back to work the way I did when I was 40. I was gonna work the way I am today. And by the way, if I haven't said this, I'm, I'm 71. So uh, it was gonna be a different world. So I began looking for work opportunities that might tickle my fancy. And I tried things that were way out of my box, but I came back to what I kind of love, which is my financial planning. And I found a firm that I really enjoyed. And they were really telling me that I can work the way I want to work, um, put in my effort the way I want to do it. And that's okay with them. They understand I'm not 30 or 40 years old anymore. Um, so I found a work responsibility that fulfills me and I can manage it in my time frame and at my speed. Um, so that was important. So let me ask you, John, because you were, um, you were basically at full retirement age when yes. you end up with myeloma. So you had spent a lot of your years um, assessing as, a, as an advisor yourself, assessing your financial needs, doing budgeting and things like that. So how can you, at, for people who are diagnosed close to retirement and retirement, and they're looking at their life, not from a perspective of financial advisor who understand what to do along the way, how, how do we guide them? How do they look at their financial picture to, 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 to present, 
put themselves in the best financial security position they can. They can. Well, that's a very good question. Um, we have under the resource tabs um, on the Health Tree Myeloma website, we have some resources, one of which is a, a budget or a cash flow form. You can find them online, you can find them other places, we can get one to you if you'd like. And I think that's where it really starts. You really need to understand what is my cash flow, what are my cash flow needs. I've worked with many people over the years who in their retirement years had no idea they, they, what their needs were, their cash flow needs were. They were just living their life. And some of those people, unfortunately, even healthy people, ended up running out of money for a variety of different reasons. And so I would encourage anyone, whether you have myeloma or not, to sit down and really start mapping out what your expenses are, what your utility costs are, what your grocery costs are. And it's very tedious work. Uh, very few people really like to do it. Um, and then match that up against your income. So if, you're, if your spouses are working, if you're working part-time, what if you're not working? What does that look like if you're getting up, if you're on social security, um, if you have retirement income, um, you know, try to figure that out um, and match that up. So you have a clear idea that maybe we've got some wiggle room here. Maybe I don't have to work full time anymore. Maybe I could work 20 hours and still address my health concerns, my energy concerns, and still have enough money coming in the door. Um, I think those, that's, that's step one. So how do, you, how do you go about prioritizing your financial life? Because well, uh, a lot of us, we prioritize uh, what we're doing during the week, what we're going to do at work with our to-do list. How do you prior prioritize your financial lives? That's a good question. I think it, it takes some, some thought, some thoughtfulness. Um, if you have a partner, talking with your partner, because sometimes your priorities may not jive necessarily. My number one priority may be my partner's last priority. <laughs> uh, try to come to some consensus about, you know, what direction do we need to head? The other thing, of course, is what does this new health dilemma pose for me? Am I, am I tired? Do I need to make time for a nap? Do I want to reduce stress in my life? How do I do that? Um, do we have a big house now that I just assume we could handle? Maybe we need to downsize and think about freeing up some equity to be available if we have larger medical needs. Um, I think being prepared, you know, um, I, uh, my kids always used to ask me what I did for a living when they were little. And I'd say, I talk about the three pigs all day. And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, do you want a straw house, a stick house, or a brick house? And because you don't know how things are going to turn, um, you really want to be prepared for whatever, rather than forcing yourself into chaos and fear and anxiety, because your health takes the wrong turn and you're not prepared for it. So you sort of have to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Exactly. And, and I told, I, I describe that exactly to my clients as well. And one of the things um, you mentioned earlier was a budget. I think a budget is your foundation for your financial life, because if you don't have a budget, you're spending money and you have no idea where it's going. And that money could be perhaps put to better use for healthcare or premiums and things like that. So but I've also found that a lot of people are afraid of budgets. They think all of a sudden, I'm not gonna be able to do anything. I'm never gonna be able to go out to eat because I'm strict. And there, people don't realize there's hundreds of different types of budgets that fit in with your personality, with your lifestyle, that they can take advantage of. And you did mention that we have some resources on our financial page and wanted to, we have a budget sheet on there as well. I, I encourage everybody to go in there and look at that. So how does a lifestyle, how does your lifestyle both now you, your lifestyle was different when you had children and you were saving money for your lifestyle. So how does changing your lifestyle 
um, affect your finances both now and if you're looking down the road because at first you said three to five years so all of a sudden your lifestyle's you know pretty much curtailed right but now you're looking further down the road much further down the road and you and you have a spouse your children are probably grown so how do you how do you define that lifestyle well that's that's a very good question as well because maybe that lifestyle needs to change um i find sometimes some patients they want to hang on to whatever they've been because they can feel normal. And now they have this new reality that they may not have consulted and, and it may necessitate a change and sometimes change is hard. I'll give you one quick example of a, of a patient that I was coaching and he ended up, actually he was a young 41 year old doctor who was an on, uh, oncological radiologist uh, or a radiological oncologist, I'm not sure which one. Um, but he was diagnosed with myeloma and what he did for a living was he read myeloma slides all day. Now, I first met him through his wife who was became his caregiver and she was panicked when I first talked to her, she was crying and sobbing and oh my God, we have our first baby. We just had our first infant. My husband just got named as head of the department in a new hospital. And what is this gonna mean for us? I mean, she was just beside herself. Well, I later talked to him and I was saying to him that I said, tell me what your day is like. And he said, well, I pretty much put in 12 hour days and um, I'm the head of the department. And I'm up at six and I'm not home until six. And I said, um, that must be very stressful. And he said, yeah, it really is. And I said, you know, looking at my Loma, I personally have come to the conclusion that stress is a negative force to your body and your mind to be able to free your money, body up and your mind up to, to put all its energy into healing. Stress can really be a, a negative factor. And he agreed. And I said, so what would you do to reduce your stress? And he said, well, I don't see how I could do anything. Um, I said, well, I know your wife's very concerned. I'm sure not being there for her is stressful. You have a new baby. I said, tell me about your being the head of the department. I said, um, would that be a big financial loss if you stopped doing that? And he said, he said, no, he said, they don't pay me anything for that. And I said, so you're spending how many hours a day extra? He said, well, at least four hours extra in my day. I said, well, what if you stopped your managerial duties and just focused on being a clinician and save the four hours and spend it with your wife and, and child? And there was silence on the other side of the phone. He said, you know, I never thought about that. He said, I could do that. And I think my life would be so much more fulfilled. I would just be disappointed, but we could do it financially. And I think that's a really good idea. So there's an example of somebody who thought in his mind, there's no way I can get off this treadmill. I'm young, I'm building my career. I have to save money for my daughter's education, blah, blah, blah. But in reality, I could take some things off my plate, still feel fulfilled, still be working on my career, but spend more time reducing stress with my family. And that to me was a very poignant moment. It was, I think, for him as well. So sometimes it's not always financial, but sometimes it's how do you optimize your energy so that you can uh, direct it towards your health. And I think um, with that, is being honest with yourself and being honest with your family. And, and when you do a budget, being honest with your budget, don't hide things, don't, don't not include things that are gonna be very, very important. Um, because the, the, the sooner you do that, the less you have to worry about the money. You already have anticipated. And again, John and I will tell everyone the benefit of working with a professional who knows about money, who knows about how to how to access funds, how to um, to minimize your tax um, uh, liabilities, how to 
you know, there are a lot of things you could do, even accessing funds prior to retirement that you can do if, if, if that's an option. There are a lot of things out there that I don't think people are aware of. And they're afraid, they think that financial advisors are people who have a lot of money. In fact, I would argue the opposite. A financial advisor is really, really important for those people who may not have a lot of money because what they're going to do is maximize your ability to use that money wisely. It's true. And I would tell you that we're fortunate because um, I am a planner. I have software and systems available to me. Um, and my wife worked with me for many years. So she actually knows our, our financial world much better and in much greater detail than I do. And she manages it totally on the computer. She sets our budget. She knows when we're over budget. And I'm very grateful to having that, um, that being attended to because I'm busy attending to other things. So when I take my myeloma nap in the afternoon, my wife is usually on the computer doing something regarding our finances. It's actually so, quite freeing. It actually can be quite freeing. Yes. Um, yes. So, so now, what kind of options with someone who has been diagnosed with myeloma, smoldering, and they're worried, right? They're at the prime of their life. They've already thought about retirement, and now they're smoldering. How do you manage both sides of that coin? Continuing to live and then not pulling back too much where now you're just, you're just stressed. You know what I'm saying? I mean, how yes. do you manage both sides of those, that coin? Well, that's really, again, very good dimension of, important dimension of, of managing a chronic illness. Um, number one, I would tell you what was helpful for me was being close to other people who were managing their chronic illness. And that came through my myeloma support group. And it came to me through the myeloma crowd or the health tree organization, because I've met some phenomenal people, many of whom are, are dealing with much greater health issues than I am, but they have, have found, fit, found the balance in their life and they have, they have listened, learned, and taken an attitude of, I'm gonna get the best of what I'm given. I'm not gonna, and my doctor said the same thing. My, one doctor said to me, she said, John, I think part of your success is your attitude. She said, because I see many, many, many cancer patients and, and, and many of them really sink back into a bitter, sometimes angry, uh, uh, space of denial and I just wish I could shake them and help them realize that they need to kind of look for the good, look for what's good in their day, look, look for what's good in their life and try to find the balance for themselves. It's not easy and it's not fun, but by doing that, um, it helped me um, treasure every day and, and try to look at, at the positive that I can find. And there usually is something there. I uh, was listening to an interview the other day with a famous rock star who was diagnosed with terminal cancer. He was on a late night show. And the, the host asked him, how has this made you look at your life differently? And he said, I relish every sandwich I get to eat. <laughs> and I thought that was kind of funny because I know exactly what he means. I, I just love the idea that I can have a great meal. And I'm so, I'm, so that's a little thing, but I know other people find it in different ways, um, whether it's their children or grandchildren or travel or whatever. Don't say no, say yes. Right. And um, I think that balance will come to you, you know, in time. Now we talk about resources and generally we're referring to uh, financial resources through nonprofits or through pharmaceutical companies. But I would challenge you to, to change your perspectives on resources. I think the, the most important resource as John mentioned a while ago is other people, other, other patients or other caregivers who are going through the same thing you're, you're going through because they have a wealth of knowledge. They're coming from different backgrounds. They have a wealth of knowledge and access to other financial resources they could tell you about and how, how they're going through treatment. 
I, I think it helps me. My husband was one of those people who was very laid back. And, you know, that day we found out the cancer diagnosis, all of a sudden, it's, 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 he was dealing with the big C word. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, our family, how is this going to change everything? And he said, you know what, I'm just going to let you be the warrior. And I am not going to take it on. And, and, and he let me do it. And it got to the point where I had to back off, too, because it wasn't good for either one of us. Um, but sitting down talking about finances is something as a financial advisor, my husband and I had done. And it is very surprising. You may think you're on the same page financially, your goals and outlooks and things, how, what makes money important to you. We thought we were on the same page, but when we actually sat down was realistic and, and honest with what we thought was important. Our, we could not have been further apart from how we looked at everything. So it's very important when you have something that's going to be very long, uh, like your, your chronic illness, and it's going to be very expensive. Now is the time, as soon as possible, to sit down and start working those things out. Everybody's going to be better off for it because it's not just that cancer patient who's suffering from cancer. It is the family. And sometimes they take on more of the worry and more of the thing than, than maybe the cancer patient is with the outside things, those extraneous things that usually it's not, you know, they're- You know, it's, it's interesting, Mike. The, one of the first things my wife did after my diagnosis was she surprised me with a very expensive puppy. <laughs> and I went- and she said, you've always talked about wanting this kind of dog and here's your therapy dog. And he was, and I have to tell you because I was diagnosed right before COVID and then we had COVID, which we all were you know, locked inside. But I swear if it wasn't for my two dogs making me laugh and making me go outside with them and playing ball, whatever it is, I would have had a very different experience. And I never would have done that for myself but my wife thought it would be really helpful. So, you know, it could be something as silly as that, but it's important. It is. Now, Diana, I know that you had some significant challenges in your life as well. And you, unlike myself, my children were grown and you had some challenges that you had to face that were quite significant. Um, how did you do that? Very interesting. My, uh, my husband was diagnosed at age 51, relatively young. Um, but I was 10 years younger than my husband. And so the whole financial dynamic was completely different. I was, I was uh, really starting in my field with in the financial, uh, financial industry. My husband had been working for a long time and, and was already thinking about retiring in four years. He was planning to retire at 55. And he was a saver. I mean, he had planned for our kids' college before I even knew him. You know, he'd already set aside money for college, for private schools and things like that. And, and then once you hear cancer, all of a sudden, you know, your goals and perspectives change. Now, I, I had spent, stayed home with my kids until they went to school. So that was non-earning years for me. And that's very significant after my husband retired, he had a pension, he eventually ended up with social security disability and then, um, using it, getting into his retirement plans. And I was saving, but then I had to stop working. I had to stop working early to start to, to take care of him. So then I was not able to save during those years. And then when he went on social security and he eventually passed in 2013, I'm thinking, oh, now this sh I'm shouldering for the first time, except for when in college, we really don't have any money. I am shouldering the big responsibility of my kids' lives, everything that we, all the debt that we have and going, moving forward with that. And surprisingly, here's something, it's not surprising, here's something that a lot of people do. And, and, and when you're talking to spouses, this is very important to get underhand early. A lot of times it is the person who's the breadwinner, the biggest breadwinner in the family, when they end up with this, this diagnosis. Then all of a sudden, their perspective on money changes too. They may have been the savers, but all of a sudden, they're going to now do things that they, they don't think they're going to have a chance to do. My husband surprised me with, remember I was saying earlier that his goals and my goals were completely different? He surprised me by saying, you know what? I always wanted a boat, so I'm going to go get a boat. Okay. 
And I'm thinking he loves fishing, a fishing boat. No, he went out and got a yacht, a 42 foot, 46 foot yacht. And I'm thinking, oh my God, there's money. That is not a money making thing. That is, I mean, sucking you dry. That will do it. And it did. And he, but he had his best time on that yacht for the, you know, 12 years, which was the only redeeming grace of that yacht. I have never been so glad to sell anything in all my life. I walked away from that. Didn't even remember looking back, saying goodbye to it. I was so glad to get under that. So there's another perspective. When you end up with an illness like that, a lot of people have a tendency to want to spend, spend, spend. You can't. You need to really look at everything and be realistic about what's going on. And, and, and if you were always a spender, now you need to become a saver and be really aware of what your money is doing, how your money is working and where it is going. So that was important to me. Did I answer your question or did I get off on a tangent? No, no, it's good. I, uh, you know, I was thinking about that. Um, in my practice, I would always say to my clients, well, here's a, here's a trite question is, when are you going to die? And they say, well, how would I know? I said, okay, well, if we plan to age 90, that's great. But what if you live to 92? Those last two years are really terrible. So I'd always say, let's plan to 100. And they'd say, oh, I'm never gonna live to 100. I said, well, you know what? I don't, how do you know? You may, and we may as myeloma patients. I know active myeloma patients who are 20 years past diagnosis <clears throat> and they're still going strong. Mm -hmm. uh, so we just don't know. And with all the great advances that we're seeing in the field of medicine and treatments for myeloma, I really do believe, and I think I've heard this from many of the, the scientists and the doctors, is that we are, uh, myeloma is becoming more of a manageable illness, chronic illness, rather than a death sentence. So I think all of us should take the attitude that we're in it for the long haul <laughs> and realize that you don't want to spend everything down to the penny uh, exactly. too soon. And for a lot of the younger uh, diagnosed people, that becomes more of a challenge uh, with inflation being extremely high now and, and the yeah. cost of everything is just eating up your dollars. And if they had to spend time off from work as well, spouse with the illness or the caregiver, that really does put a strain on your financial lives. And I would encourage them. And, and I know a lot of people that I've spoken with, speaking with someone yesterday who felt they had a really, really great income, really good income, but I am not going to take advantage of some of those resources that are available to me. That's great. Charity is wonderful. But sometimes it's to your advantage to take advantage of those things. If they're, if they're, if you are in that income uh, bracket where you can take advantage of some of those things, why not? Because you know the cost of healthcare is going up. Save those dollars. Maybe save some money in a bucket for healthcare dollars instead of spending everything right now because we know the cost is going to go up. There right. are so many things that you can do that are fairly easy moves, fairly easy tweaks. That I think it push you further down the road without becoming financially stressed immediately upon diagnosis, right? Um, and then when I was mentioning earlier, my husband was on Social Security. Now, when he eventually passed, I was not Social Security age. So that income I thought I was going to get as a survivor, you, you don't, I, it's not there. So I had to make sure I went back to work. Some of the issues may be um, I need to get some more training to go back to work. There are resources for people out there if they want to get training to go back to work. That became very, very I'd popular. like to add to that. Um, my neighbor is an attorney who was not practicing, but he decided he wanted to go back to work. So he went online and he was looking for jobs that he could put his skills to. He didn't want to be an attorney anymore, but he had skills. He liked documents. He, he could read. He could communicate. He could write. And he wanted to work from home. So he called me to just tell me he found this great job working for a law firm reviewing documents and writing up reports and sending them in all from his home office. Mm -hmm. So he was thrilled. I was shocked when I went to look back at work, how many opportunities there could be for me to not have to go to the office every day, not have to punch a clock, uh, but to sit at my home and work, you know, through Zoom or whatever it might be. So it 
that's a, a gift in some ways because it might force one out of a job that maybe they weren't so happy with anyway right. and into a new new position that was more fulfilling. Right. I think right now with the COVID, people working from home, realizing you can be as productive or more productive working from home. And if you have, uh, or your, if your immune system is compromised, what a better opportunity to explore that than now. You know, there are so many jobs that are out there and they're paying more than maybe what you're, you know, we have a tendency to be comfortable, even though we're miserable at our jobs. This is a great opportunity to step out outside the yeah. box. Life skills are invaluable. We talk about um, emotional intelligence. You know, if you've been out working in, in all kinds of situations, you have some of that emotional intelligence some younger people have to, don't have. And that is, that is a soft skill that employers are looking for. Take advantage of this opportunity. Now, I know um, there are resources out there, as you've said, you know, for example, travel resources. Mm -hmm. So I travel two and a half hours over and back in a day to see my specialist. Um, I know people that travel more than that. Mm -hmm. I talked to a, a recent coachee of mine here. She's traveling to from Tampa to MD Anderson in Texas for her stem cell transplant. And she's gonna live in her RV in the parking lot of the hospital. Wow. And I said, well, first of all, there are some closer facilities you might want to consider, <laughs> but she's got it made up. But I said, you know, you might be able to get um, some financial reimbursement for that trip. And she said, oh, I, I never thought of that. So there are interesting resources. And Diana, you and I both know a coach that has seems to be a master of getting taking advantage of all the little treats that are out there. As an example, he got 50 yard line tickets to the Super Bowl one year because they had put a certain number of tickets aside for people with illness or disability and he qualified. And that never would have occurred to me, but it would have, it would have been a fun thing to do, improve right. my attitude. And that uh, would include things like, um reducing the cost of your student loans. A lot of people carry student loans into retirement. Those things it seem like they never go away, but he's been able to maneuver that because of the myeloma diagnosis that he has. So there's a lot of things out there. If you get on our resource page, if you listen to our webinars, if you read our articles, there are so many resources out there that are available to you. Um, and so for those people who have young children, there are resources for people with cancer where they can get childcare for travel. You can get um, American Cancer Society will help with room and board if you're getting treatment outside of, the, outside of your local area. And they'll put you up at really nice places. We've stayed at the West End in Chicago on, on, the, on the Magnificent Mile. I mean, there are some things that they can do that really, really help you. And I, I encourage everyone to take advantage of those things. Now, um, like we're talking about the cost of healthcare is extremely high and it's going up. And medications, the cost of medications are growing up, going up. I would encourage everyone to, to look at our page that talks about, um, especially Revlimid. We know, and we had that lenalidomide. That is the generic. Well, that generic is only a few thousand dollars less than the, um, the Revlimid. In addition to that, and I'm finding that a lot of doctors are, say, are putting people on that, that uh, generic but it's hard to find. It's not, it's not completely out, right? So it's, it's becoming one of those things that's very difficult to find. And some insurance companies are actually telling their insurers that they have to get that generic, but they're having a hard time finding it. So um, whenever you're looking at your finances, look at your healthcare now and what your plan to have done next year in, if, you're changing, um, in, if you're changing treatments. And include that in your insurances. Now, remember, open enrollment for the exchange is coming up November 1st. It's going to run. So look at, do comparison shopping, please. That is going to be your biggest, your, your main foundation for your health and your health care going forward. John and Diana, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. My computer in the other room was doing weird stuff, so I'm glad that I got found a place where it's working um that was an excellent discussion I think the flow between you two and just the the topics that you guys were able to hit on have been very helpful I really enjoyed this format that you guys have had there are several questions so I wanted to make sure we tackle those 
One of the questions that I see here is, is there any way to find out the odd out of pocket costs of your entire lifetime of treatment? I mean, no, <laughs> unfortunately, yeah, you right? Don't know what treatment you're going to be on and or for how long? Let's talk about plans to change. Yeah, totally. Let's talk about, for example, if you're um, if you're newly diagnosed and your multiple myeloma specialist was to prescribe you RVD, Revlimid, Velcade, Dexamethasone, how would you know how much your insurer is going to cover and how much you would pay out of pocket? Mm -hmm. The first well, thing is to get your insurance policy and then call. Yes. John, you can add. Well, I, that was the thing. That was exactly what I was going to say. Uh, you need to understand what your benefits actually cover and how these different companies uh, treat the specific drugs that you've been prescribed. Uh, RVD is fairly common. By the way, the V, the Velcade part, is actually not a pharmaceutical. It's treated under uh, Part B of Medicare. So when I first started, my first claim was kicked back and it was, I don't know, $5,000 or something. I don't remember what it was and I freaked out. And then I called the finance office of my practice and I said, what is this? I thought this was gonna be covered. And they said, oops, we're sorry. We uh, filed it incorrectly and we'll refile it under uh, part B as opposed to pharmaceutical. And that was in the doctor's office that administers mm -hmm. the, uh, the medicine. So uh, pay attention, you know, understand things so you can see that if there's something that's out of whack, you know how to ask a question. And ask ahead of time, when you first start diagnosis or you're starting treatment, find out what medications are gonna be involved. And it's not just those primary medications. You may end up with other things as well. You may need to sub do kidney supplements. You may need to do um, diabetes supplements. And those things are costly as well. Find out what this treatment is gonna, uh, in, uh, is gonna cost you and look at your insurance. Your insurances will change, can change their what they're gonna cover every year, especially Medicare. Those things change a lot. There's a lot of, there's a lot of changes coming up <laughs> January 1st. <laughs> exactly. So John, know. let's talk a little bit more about this Medicare. Um, Rex was wondering if you could go into more detail about Medicare with supplements and how that has helped pay for your chronic illness versus the Medicare Senior Advantage, which is what um, lots of our patients have. Yes. Uh, and Diana knows a lot about this as well. I just know that when I first uh, became 65 and I left my corporate benefit plan, I decided to go towards Medicare and I was healthy. I was 65 years old and healthy. I had very few medical problems. And every and um, the agent I talked to said, well, everybody in Vermont buys this plan, which was the Medicare Advantage plan. So that's what I did. And it was fine until I got diagnosed. And then I called my friend who was in the business and he said, get off that plan immediately and get onto a regular Medicare plan. Now, what we know um, and you're seeing, I'm, I'm seeing it online much more this year than before. There is a difference between Medicare Advantage and Medicare. And it goes back to the old adage, if something is free, it probably isn't. So the, here's the issue that I see, to try to sum it up very quickly. Um, if you're not paying a premium, for something such as Medicare Advantage, you're going to pay some way else, probably with out-of-pocket costs. And you have to be very aware of that. Whereas Medicare, you are already paying a premium. You're going to pay for a supplement um, on top of that. Um, and you're going to buy, you know, a la carte a pharmaceutical plan, et cetera, et cetera. Feels like a lot of money, but not knowing how your illness is going to evolve, you can be assured that no matter what happens, you don't have to ask to go see another specialist. Your co-pays are going to be covered. You can go to see any doctor anywhere. And in myeloma, you know, we've all met myeloma patients. One fellow was from 
Nashville, and he went to Arkansas because he found a doctor there that he wanted to see. And then that doctor moved to New York. So he went up to Sloan Kettering to be with that doctor and he never had to worry about it. Now, I know things have improved. Some of my friends who are on Medicare Advantage say they haven't had a problem. And I think of that as being kind of lucky because they really don't know why they didn't have a problem. And there may come a time in their health history where they're gonna wish they had better coverage. Um, and it's, 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 if you're working with a broker, I would think that broker could help you figure out uh, what your worst case scenario might be. Right. And exactly. And that's what I was going to um, add here is this is something that would be great if you wanted to connect with one of our Myeloma financial coaches to talk it out with them. And then they could recommend you to, hey, I really think you're going to need more professional help here. Here's my recommendations of who you could see. I mean, it's so helpful to be able to say, OK, talk to me more about what you think about this or I'm thinking this. What do you think? And getting this professional help. Um, and then they are well trained to know like when it's time for them to stop giving free advice and you to start getting more personalized advice that you would pay for. So excellent answer. Thank I, you. I have one other thought on that. And that is to realize okay. that you and your spouse, if you have a, a partner in that way, may be on different coverages. You don't both have to be on exactly the same coverage. So my wife is very healthy. She has she never goes to the doctor. She's gone to make sure that there's nothing really coming. And we've decided that for her, she might be better off going to a more high deductible plan. And if she gets ill, we still know that we'll never pay more than we would have if we paid a higher premium. But that's not what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do something different or I do something different. Great point, great point, thank you. Shelly's wondering, what about a life insurance that has a living benefit? And Diana, I'll give this one. Well, actually, either, either one actually, of you could I, answer I, that. If you don't mind, I, I live this yeah. stuff. In fact, yeah, just before I just this call, that. I was talking to a client about their living benefit. So life insurance typically today, and actually for several years, many companies, the better companies, have been offering riders, some of which have no cost, some of which do have cost. And they're typically called either an accelerated benefit rider or a living needs benefit or a benefit uh, rider. And they, what the company can do is if you are diagnosed with a chronic illness, um, typically that's gonna be uh, terminal in nature or with some policies, even if you need long-term care uh, services, the company will advance to cash to you at no cost, no questions. That, well, you have to qualify, but um, and it's an advancement of the actual death benefit. So, if you are in a terminal illness situation and you expect that you will probably pass away within the year, but your expenses for care over that year are going to be very, very high. Take some of that money from the life insurance policy. It just means that your death benefit at your death will be less by the amount that you were advanced earlier. And, and I but then your go ahead. Go ahead. I was just uh, gonna say, but then your family's less left with less medical debt and less problems when it comes to that. Exactly. So I think it's a great benefit. I I think it's available in today's world with most uh, term or permanent coverages, actually. Um, the other thing I should mention, since we're talking about it, is if you are a patient and you have term insurance, realize that that term insurance is going to get expensive one day. And, and you might want to look into options of converting that term insurance. And when you do that, you could put on a uh, cr a critical illness benefit if you didn't have it already. And if you have if you have the opportunity, especially coming up at the time, this is open enrollment period for a lot of people, or you may have a life extenuating circumstance during the year where you can go back and change your benefits. If you do not qualify for life insurance now and you're still working, this is a great time to pick up that life insurance at work. And some of those insurances can be um, can go with you. 
which means you don't have to, you don't have to qualify for underwriting, you don't have to do blood or urine, you don't have to say you have myeloma. You can go in and you can get qualified for insurance. And a lot of those policies are you can move with you. And if you want to convert it to your own policy, you don't have to do underwriting again as long as you're not increasing the death benefit on that rider. Thank you. Two more questions here. And there was also a comment um, about how nurse navigators can really help find these kind of resources. To, so to remember to use them on your team as part of this searching for financial resources. So great point. Um, one of the final questions says, does your financial planner have to be familiar with medical costs? They really should be. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like a double like, yes. Right. <laughs> like, yes. You, you don't want a painter who paint cars to paint your house. You know, it's basically the same thing. You want somebody who's familiar with, because it's not, it's not an easy, it, it's very intricate. There's a lot of moving parts when you come to healthcare. And so that person needs to be aware of the healthcare system, how it works. They need to understand billing. They need to understand insurances. Mm. Yes, they need to understand that. Yeah, I think that the, the studies show that the greatest surprise of most retirees is how much they have to spend on healthcare costs. And I think that in the literature that I read, I think it's underappreciated. I think it's, uh, I think people need to have more money available than less. Exactly, I agree. Definitely, thank you. And then the last one, maybe if we can get some clarification here. Phyllis has been told that she cannot get into a Medigap plan because she has multiple myeloma and must stay on her Advantage plan. A lot of times, if you did not get into a Medigap supplement plan uh, at, at your um, initial enrollment period and you already have a disease, they can decline you. You have guarantee issue from your initial enrollment period. That is the best time to get a Medicare Medigap plan because later, if you wait a year or so, they can decline you. Interesting. Absolutely. Yes, the other thing I should say is um, I'm in Florida and every state is different. And there may be different companies available. And when I, when my friend said, get off that advantage plan, get onto a supplement plan, there were eight companies available and only one company would take me, luckily. Mm -hmm. And they did. And that was Mutual of Omaha. So I'm not a plug up, but I do want you to know that. Um, I was a little shocked that they did. Yeah. And they've been great. So, so Omaha is one of those companies who have, get a lot more leeway than a lot of companies do for a lot of things. Interesting. Okay, well, thank you both so much. Are there any other closing statements, Diana, that I'll have you go first and then John um, that you would like to make before we finish today? Again, I would encourage everyone, first of all, to do your budget, to sit down with a professional. And a lot of times they will meet with you the first time without any cost at all and you can start giving you some guidance. Um, you can reach out to us as a financial coaches to help steer you, get you started. And um, and don't be surprised at the cost. And generally, as a financial advisor, can give you returns of 1% to 4% of what you can do on your own. In addition, give you some invaluable advice that you're not going to mm -hmm. because that's they're professionals. That's what they do. John? Well, I would agree with that. Um, and I'm not treating my own horn here, but I, I met with an 83-year-old fellow the other day uh, who's become a client. And his previous advisor really was a life insurance agent. And I'm sure he's a very good life insurance agent. Um, but I'm a planner and I take a more holistic view and I understand all the things we've been talking about tonight or today. Uh, he said to me, I've learned more from you in 20 minutes than I've learned in 20 years from that other guy. Wow. And, and that's not tooting my horn. That's just because I have different training and I have a different um, approach. Um, and I think just as you might look for a second opinion in medicine, you might look for second opinions in your financial assistance as well. Exactly. Planners, and we understand the importance of planning life financial planning. Yeah, great input. Thank you both so much. Thank you all for attending today, for taking the time out of your day. Just a reminder to fill out that um, follow-up survey that Zoom will prompt you to take as you leave the meeting. Um, join us next year. Oh my gosh, so exciting to say. Can't believe it's November already. We're going to take a hiatus in December so that we can all get some rest. But in January on the 3rd, we're going to welcome in the new year with the topic preparing your tax filing for 2022. Um, 
Um, and then you may be interested in other community events. Tomorrow we have the Health Tree Moves chapter. We're going to be having a yoga class where we talk about the benefits of myeloma. We do yoga together. It's going to be awesome. And that's led by myeloma patient Jean Becker. And then we're going on the third, we're going virtually, we're going into the Southeast part of the United States, where we will have our discussion, building your healthcare team together. And that's all the way from Delaware to Georgia. So quite a big range. If you find yourself within that region, please join us. And then November the 8th is our stem cell transplant chapter. We're going to be reviewing a little known incredible resource that is existing on our website, which is the complete guide to stem cell transplant. So we want to highlight that resource, show you where you can find it and show you where you can share it with others. So the link to sign up for any of those events and even more events I haven't mentioned is found at the bottom of the slide and will be included in our follow-up email. Another big thank you to our sponsors, Bristol Myers Squibb, GSK, Genentech, Abby, and Amgen. And again, thank you to each of you for helping us build this community. We appreciate you. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, John, and thank you, Diana. Excellent thank job, you, you guys. Bye-bye. Take care.